Well, good morning, church. Welcome to our services today. I want to let you know about a week from today, I'm starting a new series on my favorite book in the Bible, the little book of Philippians. And that's part of the reason it's my favorite book is because it's so short and I struggle reading longer books. But it's four chapters and some of the greatest lines in the whole Bible come from this little book. So for example, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's Philippians. Um, do everything without complaining or arguing. Also Philippians. Um, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Philippians. And so I, I'm really excited about preaching through that book. And so I really hope that you can come back next week and we will kick off that series. Now today, if you're new to this church, maybe it's your first time, maybe you're just checking us out, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about an event we do every week. It's called First Cup. It happens at 9.30 during our Bible class time. And it's mainly for people that just don't know a whole lot about this church or this church culture or the history here and just kind of want to ask questions and figure out ways to get involved uh, this event is for you, and, and sure hope you can come back next week at 9.30 uh, to join us for that. Sometimes when you come to church here for the first time, uh, we talk about things that make sense to people that go here, but maybe you're new and you have no idea what we're talking about. Like Scott's talking about welcome books, and you hear people throwing around language like fellowship central and information central and ministry central, and you don't have a clue what they're saying. Well, great thing to do would be to go to First Cup, and it's just a good way to start getting oriented with this church family. So hopefully we can see you there next week. Now, if you're also, maybe this is your first time, or if you've just been coming in just a few weeks maybe, uh, and you come today and it's Elder Sunday. Now, you might be thinking, no, why, you know, why, I just wanted a normal worship service. Why, why did I come on a day when they're doing this big elder installment thing? Well, let me tell you. Sometimes you can actually learn a whole lot about a family by observing the way that they conduct their family business. And so this actually is a great day to be at church because what you will see is the way that we're going to handle putting leaders in place tells you a lot about this church family. You see, leadership is extremely important to, to this church family and to our history. And part of the reason that we've been able to make such an impact in the community and part of the reason that we've maintained such a organizational health is because of our leadership. And so it's really, really important to this church family. You can learn a lot about family uh, from the way they conduct family business. I'll never forget when I was 10 years old, I, I lived about a mile away from my aunt, uncle, and cousins. And one day I uh, rode my bike from my house to their house, and I was going to hang out with my cousin Lacey and Logan, and then I had an aunt, uncle, Marianne, and Rory Rosenbaum, and I get to their house, and I knock on the door, and nobody answers. And so I wait for a while longer, knock again, no one answers, and so then I open the door, and it's unlocked, so I walk in the house, and nobody's in the house. So I check the bedrooms, no one's there, I walk in the kitchen, no one's there, and I'm thinking, I know that someone was just here a while ago, because I called you on the phone before I left, but there's just nobody there. Well, then I look in the backyard and I see them and they're all like in a circle, all four of them, just like holding hands, doing something. And so I go out the back door thinking, this is great. They must be having like an afternoon Devo. I like Devos. Let's sing some Kumbaya together. And so I'm walking out to see what they're doing and like 10 steps into it, I realize that this is not Kumbaya in the afternoon. This is their dead dog's funeral. And so... They've had this dog 20 years, just died. And so, I, you know, I'm a happy guy, you know, joyful and, hey, guys. And then I see all the tears coming off their faces. And I'm like, I'm just going to hang out in your living room and bury my head in your couch. I'll see you in a minute. And I felt really strange about that. But you learn a lot from a family by watching how they conduct their family business. And so that's what we're going to do for a moment today. Now, just to kind of start at square one. We are an elder-led church. Now, now, the reason for that is because as we read the New Testament, what we find is that when Paul started the first churches in the first century, he would go around and, and he would put elders in place to lead those churches. See, there's a lot of churches today that they don't have the exact same uh, leadership structure. There's other ways to lead a church. But the way that we've chosen to do it, because we're trying to do things to the best of our ability, according to scriptures, is we put elders in place. Now, can anybody guess how many elders you think we have before we install these, these five men today? Anybody have a guess? Okay, a lot, a lot of good guesses out there. It's, I, I believe it's 22. Is that what you think? 
22 elders. So we're adding five today, so that'll put it up to 27. Now the reason we have generally around that number of elders is because one of the greatest ways for our elders to do ministry and to shepherd people is through our Bible class system. If you're a uh, new or, or maybe most people probably don't know this stat, but one of the most unique features about Memorial Road Church of Christ is that 90% of the people that attend worship services also attend a Bible class. And so what that means is, is people who are really connected, not just in this room, but in, in the Bible class system. And so because of that, the elders like to shepherd through Bible classes. And so an elder and, and his wife are assigned to a Bible class, and that's primarily where they engage with people. It's a lot easier to, to, to invest in the lives of 100 people uh, versus 23 hundred people and they do it they do a great job of that so the best way to get to know an elder is to be involved in bible class and to get to know the elder in your bible class now here here's what i would like to do just for a few moments this morning what what i want to do is i want to go to scripture and try to answer two questions very simply question number one is what exactly is an elder supposed to do with the people and question number two is what are the people supposed to do with the elders and so, in general, what I'm trying to tackle here is what exactly is supposed to be the relationship between elders and, and their church? How are elders supposed to lead? And then how are we as people under their leadership supposed to follow them? And so, 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, this, this text read earlier, Peter's talking here, and I want to read it again just, to, just so you get it in your brains even more. Here's, here's what he says, 1 Peter chapter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glories to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lowering it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Now, if you're wondering, like, what, you know, what exactly is an elder? What kind of person is this? You just look through this paragraph that Peter's writing, and you'll, you'll find words like, he is willing. Like, it's not that he has to do these things. It's not like it's, a, it's an obligation, like, oh, great, I have to be an elder again. No, he wants to serve. Like, there's a willingness there. Uh, you find words like, He's an example to the flock. He's eager to serve. That's a great phrase there, which if you had to find three words which summarize like what an elder is supposed to do, that's it. They're eager to serve. Uh, the, the main uh, metaphor that, that, that Peter uses here and is used throughout Scripture is this idea of a shepherd. Now, if you think about this, in today's time, shepherd has more of a dignified connotation. Usually the only time we think about shepherds for the most of us is probably around Christmas time when we're thinking about the, the birth narrative of Jesus and we think, oh, it's those shepherds in the field and they were the ones that brought Jesus into the world. And we love shepherds and they're so, they're so wise and just so wonderful. Well, in, in Bible times, it's not that shepherds had a negative connotation, but it, it wasn't so glorified. In fact, shepherds were about as low as you can get on the vocational totem pole of the time. It was not a prestigious position to be a shepherd. In fact, in the Old Testament, if you remember the story of David and Goliath, so David, before he fights Goliath, he goes out and he's, he's bringing food to his brothers because they're on the front lines and they're about to go fight. And so David, this young boy, brings the food to them and they're really irritated and really bitter that he's not fighting with them. And one of the things they say to make fun of him is they say, what are you doing here, shepherd boy? Like, why aren't you back attending the sheep with our father? And so shepherd was a very demeaning thing back then, that they were using that against David. And so what this means in this context, and what I'm, why I'm bringing this up, is that elders don't, don't, don't come to this position so that they can have authority and power and lord it over people. They're servants. That they just, they just want to serve you. In fact, elders lead from service, not necessarily from status. J Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 20, when he said that, if anybody wants to be great among you, he must be your servant. And so if you want to be great, you've got to serve. And so elders, what they do is they lead this congregation, but it's not because of authority and power and status. They lead because they serve. First and foremost, they just want to make your life better. And let me tell you something. 
I respect every single elder that this church has. And the reason I respect them is not because they're, they're brilliant in their profession or because they have letters after their name or because they have plaques on their wall. The reason that I respect these men who lead this church is because I get to watch the way in which they love you. So, for example, every time they have an elders meeting, before they get to the business of whatever they're talking about that day in relation to this church, they always stop and they pray for you all. Anytime you fill out a prayer request card from the, the welcome books, they read those and they pray for you. Anytime you, you bring up a prayer request in a Bible class, they talk about those things and they pray for you. Like I'm telling you, every elder at this church to a man cares deeply about you. They care deeply about this church. I'm telling you, to a man, they would die for this church. And that's why I trust these men. You see, we live in an age where there's a lot of skepti skepticism towards, insta or to, towards, uh, towards hierarchies and towards big institutions and big organizations. And people are very, very wary of putting their trust into big corporations and big hierarchies. Well, well I want to tell you personally that I trust these men. I have the utmost respect and the utmost admiration and the utmost trust for the people that shepherd this particular congregation. And let me tell you why. For example, a few months ago, there was a young, uh, young adult who was in our worship service and had some health problems during church. And she couldn't drive herself home. She lives pretty far away. And, and guess who it was that took her home? Well, two of our shepherds stepped up and they said, hey, we'll take her home. That's the reason I trust these men. It's because they care about the people here. Uh, another example is a few years ago, there was a young man who was having a really difficult time in life, having a lot of personal problems. And to compound his personal problems, he couldn't even make his payments to get through his semester in college. Well, guess who it was that stepped up and helped this young man get through his semester in college so he could work on all of his personal problems? It was an elder. You see, these elders care about people. A few years ago, some, some inmates got out of prison, didn't have a place to stay, didn't have a place to get themselves on their feet as they tried to re-enter society. And guess who it was that invited these people into their home? It was an elder at this particular congregation. Like, that's, that's the reason I trust these men. I can't tell you how many times that someone in this church has lost somebody. And guess who it is that stands by their side in those moments of pain? It's, it's, it's the elders. It's the elders who are in the hospitals. It's the elders who are making these phone calls to these people. And then the reason I tell you all these things again, it's not to say that every single time in your life when you have the, the tiniest thing go wrong, then the elders are just going to be Superman and save you from everything. No, that, that's not the reason I, I'm telling you these things. Because I know that some of you are thinking that now you have a way to pay for your kid's college. But I'm not telling you that for that reason. I'm just saying they can be trusted. And the reason they be, can be trusted is because they lead from service, not status, and because they truly care about the people at this church. Question number two. So we go to this church. We've got these 22, now 27 men leading this congregation. What's our role? What's our job as far as how to follow elders? Well, Peter talks about that as well in the next verse in this chapter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says this. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. And so when it comes to elders, Peter's suggesting, hey, you all need to lead from your service, not your status. And when it comes to people under the eldership, he's saying the best thing for you to do is to submit to these men that God has placed in positions of authority in your local congregation. Now we have to ask the question, what exactly does it mean to submit to elders? Now does that mean that we have to robotically follow every single thing that they say as if we have no opinion and no um, individuality to think about Scripture in our own relationship with God? Is, is that what it's saying, that we're just a bunch of robots that have to do what they say? I don't think that's what biblical submission means in this context. And the reason I say that is because you, you can think of other stories in the Bible in which an elder were to say something or do something, and if that's not necessarily the right thing, then the people didn't follow it. So, for example, Paul has an encounter with Peter in Galatians chapter 2. Peter 
says that he himself is an elder. And there's this story in Galatians chapter 2 in which Peter, at the beginning, is hanging out with the Gentiles. These are the outsiders. He's having lunch with them. He's befriending these outsiders to the faith. Well, then some Jews come into town, and Peter, an elder, says, whoa, 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 I don't think I'm going to hang out with you anymore. I'm going to you know, pick up my tray from this lunch table and move it to this lunch table because I want to hang out with these people over here. Now, Paul comes in on the scene, and you've you got to think, okay, well, what's Paul going to do? Paul disagrees with Peter. He doesn't think Peter should be doing that. But does Paul come in and say, well, I, I probably can't say anything because you know, Peter's an elder, and Peter was an apostle, and I'm just not sure if I should really go there, so maybe I'll just keep my opinions to myself. No. Paul sees clearly that something is not going right, and so he says something. In a loving way, he confronts Peter. So the reason I say that is, is when Peter in his book is saying we need to submit to our elders, he's not saying that we blindly just follow every single thing as if we are robots. No, that, that's not a great definition of submission. Here's a better def definition of submission. Submission is simply moving from preference to deference. And let me explain what I mean by that. Everybody has preferences, and we know what preferences are. Uh, if you're a coffee drinker, you probably have a preference as far as how you like your coffee to be made. If you go to a restaurant and order a steak, you probably have a preference as far as how you want that steak cooked. You've got preferences on your TV shows that you watch. And all of us have church preferences too. You've got certain times where Scott leads a song and you're like, yes, that, that song's in my preference. I like that song. And then Scott leads other songs and you're like, no, 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 I don't prefer that song. Sometimes I preach for a certain length and you're like, yeah, that was it. You preach 15 minutes every week. That's my preference. And then other weeks you're like, Phil, come on, that's not my preference. So, so we know what it is like to have preferences and church preferences. Now, deference, that's a word we don't use as much. Deference simply means that when two people have an opinion, one person defers or yields their own opinion for the sake of another. You just defer. So I think one thing, you think another, so I'm going to defer what I think in favor of what you think. That's what deference is. So later today you're having a discussion about where you're going to eat and you think, well, I really want Italian. And someone else in your friend group or your family group thinks, no, I really want Mexican. You might be able to say, you know what, I defer to your decision to meet, eat, to eat Mexican. Which, by the way, you should always defer when it's between Italian and Mexican. You should always defer towards Mexican. But that's just my, my opinion there. But that's, that's deference. And so all submission is, it's just moving from the type of person who's always obsessed with their own preferences to the type of person that can practice deference. It's the type of person that can say, you know what, I don't agree 100% on this, but you know what, I'm going to defer to your opinion because I respect you. That's what it means to submit to your elders. You see, our elders have a difficult, difficult job, and let me tell you why. They govern a church of 2,300 members. 2,300. Okay, I've got four people in my family, and we can't even agree on like anything. And they're governing a church of 2,300? I mean, most nights, not every night, but we try to do a family devotional most nights in, in, in my home. And so there's only four of us, and let me tell you something. Sometimes our family devotionals are the most conflicted time of the entire day. Like we'll go into like a little Bible thing and I'll grab the kid's Bible and I'll say, All right, girls, we're going to talk about Joseph tonight. And they'll say, I don't want to talk about Joseph tonight. Like it's Joseph. He's the, co the coat of many colors. How, how can you not like Joseph? I don't want to talk about him tonight. So, we'll, okay, we'll move on to something else. Okay, well, let's just, you know, let's just sing Jesus Loves Me. I don't want to sing Jesus Loves Me. And then I'll say, you know, Mary, come on. We, we, we can sing Jesus Loves Me. It's okay. <laughs> we have fights all the time. I'm telling you, there's four of us. And we've had so many nights where there's almost been a church split in our family. And it's four. Okay, our shepherds, 2,300. So the next time that you have something that you prefer, just think really carefully before you voice that to an elder. They're managing 2,300 people. And in order to submit to them, we must move from preference to deference. You see, our elders have a hard job, but they do a great job. They do a great job. 
You see, part of the reason that Memorial Road has had such an influence in the community and part of the reason that we've had so much internal health is because of our leadership. They're committed to love and they're committed to unity. And because of that, this church has managed to do a lot of great things over the years because they're following Jesus and we're following their leadership. Now, last thing I wanted to say is I, I just wanted to say a quick word to, to the to new elders, to Jason and to Chris and to uh, James and Jeff and Tom. I don't, I don't know where, where Jeff is sitting, but I see the rest of you. There you are. But uh, I just want you all to know, first and foremost, that you guys are my elders, and I'm submitting my life to your care and to your leadership, and it's, it's not because you guys are really successful and you guys can manage your business really well and you've got letters after your name and you're really smart, which you guys are all those things, but I'm just telling you, the reason I feel comfortable submitting my life to your leadership is because you follow Jesus. And if you're following Jesus, I'm going to follow you. And that's the one thing I would say to you all is that if you will follow Jesus personally, then the rest of you, then the rest of us, we will follow you corporately. Because if you're following Jesus, we're going to follow you. Next part of our, our service, um, Bob Harmon's going to come up and he's going to introduce uh, these five men and their wives to you all. I'll turn it over to Bob. Thank you, Phil, for that fine lesson. It is my privilege to introduce to this service the five men who will serve as elders along with their families. First of all, Jeff Floyd, his wife Misty, have been at Memorial Road for 12 years. Jeff is a family physician and Misty is a homemaker. They have six children, Addie, Aaron, Benny, Sam, Lucy, and Josie. Jeff is a deacon who teaches adult Bible classes Serves as a camp counselor, has volunteered at Capitol Hill Medical Clinic. Jeff and Misty are leaders in the Christian couples class, Q group leaders, and work in children's ministry. Jason Garner and his wife Heidi have been at Memorial Road for 13 years. Jason is a petroleum engineer, and Heidi is a homemaker. They have four children, Alan, an OC student, Nathaniel, Jesse, and Meg attend school at OCA. Jason is a deacon who teaches Bible, adult Bible classes, is the help and then the Helping Hearts Ministry Director. Heidi teaches children's Bible classes, been a senior high D group leader. James Hill, and his wife Jenna, been at Memorial Road for 23 years. James is the executive director for the Medits, an organization that employs developmentally, developmentally and intellectually challenged adults. Jana is a photographer. They have two children, Sydney, an OC student, and Grant attends school at Oakdale. James serves as a deacon, and they both are currently working in the youth and family ministry ministry as seventh grade D group leaders. Chris McKeever and his wife Tammy have been at Memorial Road for 11 years. Chris is director of finance for Sonic and Tammy is the business manager for Memorial Road. The daughter Monique is an OCA student. Chris is a deacon who helps with ministry sun with Mission Sunday is on the involvement team. Tammy teaches in Journeyland, is an LTC course director. They both lead in young adults class and serve in the youth group. Tom Poteet and his wife Robin have been at Memorial Road for 20 years. Tom is manager of power systems at Devon Energy and Robin is a real estate appraiser. They have two children Evelyn, a teacher in Smyrna, Tennessee, is engaged to be married, and Andrew is a senior at OC. Tom is a deacon who teaches adult Bible classes. Robin also teaches Bible classes and both involved in Honduran missions. Welcome.
Will the man on uh, stage uh, please stand along with the other elders? You men on stage have been recognized by the members of this congregation as well as the present elders as men who embody the scriptural ideals for the office of elder. We have watched you and your wives and known each one of you for many years and have observed your service to the Lord. Uh, we again uh, have seen you as you have shown your love for ministry and people of this congregation. We believe you truly to be men and women of God who seek to serve the Lord more than anything else. Your statements of commitment further affirm that you're ready to assume the responsibility of being elders in God's church. On behalf of the elders and the congregation, I give you this charge, that you love the Lord rather than the office, that you faithfully serve His word rather than any personal agenda, and that you dedicate yourself to serving this church and all of its people to the end that we might be pleasing to God, praise His name, and spend eternity together. Do you accept uh, this charge? I will. If you support these men as elders of this church, will you please stand as an indication of your support? At this time, uh, the elders uh, will uh, come up and surround these men as we sing this song. Father in heaven, we bring the names of these men who are being appointed as elders in your church today and their wives before you. We ask for your blessings on them. Jeff and Misty Floyd, James and Jana Hill, Chris and Tammy McKeever, Jason and Heidi Garner, Tom and Robin Poteet. As Paul taught the elders in Ephesus, we pray that each of these men will keep watch over the flock and be shepherds in the full sense of the words. We pray that their wives will support them in every aspect of the responsibilities that they take on today. Further, we pray that every member of the congregation will support them in every way as they carry out their God-given responsibilities. We thank you for giving us these godly men and women, as well as for every other blessing of life that we enjoy every day of our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. These elders and their wives are a lot better behaved than the children were last week for Mother's Day on stage. So that was very, very good. You guys have learned a lot. And if you weren't here last week, there was a lot of children on the stage going crazy. So, you know, one of my uh, favorite things that we do is, is when people come forward, you'll see that many times elders and their wives come and surround 
uh, people who are hurting. And that's what shepherds do. They surround the flock in love and in care. One of the verses immediately after uh, the stuff about elders and, and how to follow them in 1 Peter 5 is this very simple line which says, Cast all of your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. And I find it really fitting that that verse, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you, is stuck right next to these verses about how elders love and lead the flock because sometimes the way in which we experience the care of God is when elders love us. And one of the great ways that you, one of the great opportunities that you have in this church family is that when when you have anxiety and just stuff going on in your life, every week we encourage you that that if it that, that if, it, if the timing's right, we want you to tell us about that because we've got men and women who want to surround you uh, with prayer. James 5 tells us that if you're in trouble, you should pray. It tells us that if you're sick, you should call the elders to pray for you because the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And we believe that at this church family. And so if you have something going on in your life that, that you want prayers for, we're going to have a time in just a moment for you to respond to that. Others of you might be thinking about a spiritual decision in your life. Perhaps there's some of you who have never made the decision to follow Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism. Let me tell you, there's nothing that, that, that encourages the hearts of the elders and me and so many, else, so many other people in this congregation more uh, than when people give their lives to Jesus in baptism. So if there's either of those two things we can do for you, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.